Good evening and welcome to this year's uh, John Freeman Lecture. We see a lot of new faces. For those of you who are not aware and are not regular attenders, this is an annual event that is co-hosted by MIT's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and by the Hydraulics and Water Resources Group of the Boston Society of Civil Engineers section of ASCE. And the funding for this comes from the Freeman Fund, which is administered by BSCE and results from a generous donation that John Freeman gave us, gave the um, society on his death. He was a graduate of MIT and a, one of the more famous engineers of our um, country that toiled in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, most uh, recognized in these parts for his design work on the original uh, Charles River Dam. Uh, the Freeman Fund is administered by a group of people who have put together a website, which you can see the first page of, and within a couple days this will be accessible through the BSCES um, webpage, and this gives a little bit of the history of the Freeman Fund, some of John Freeman's accomplishments. One of the goals of the Freeman Fund is to support uh, the efforts educational efforts of young engineers and so you can see some of the grants that have uh, come out of this uh, fund in the past. Also a history of some of the lectures that have been given and you'll be able to get a copy, uh, download a copy of today's lecture. So to introduce today's speaker I'd like to introduce Professor Richard Vogel from Tufts University. Thank you, Eric. It's my privilege to introduce Peter Rogers tonight. Uh, first, let me give you a little bit of background on his academic training. In 1966, he got his PhD at Harvard, and, and that was during the heyday of the Harvard Water Program, which I don't know if many of you were around at that time, but it's had quite an impact. Um, and for example, I'm an academic grandchild of that program, with my advisor having been trained there. He uh, received his PhD and after receiving his PhD in 66 he's been on the faculty at Harvard and has had held the Gordon McKay uh, pr professor of environmental engineering and city and regional planning uh, at Harvard broadly I would say his scholarship and his interests are in the area of water and environmental economics as well as water and environmental engineering but he's really his scholarship and his work is really quite unique among engineers uh, because it includes first of all it includes both text Book, books, uh, not textbooks, specifically books and articles. Many of us, many engineers in, uh, in universities do not write uh, books. They write mostly articles. Some of his, uh, his books that, are, are comp that have come out recently, Water in the Arab World, which d deals with integrated water resource management and conflict resolution yeah, in international basins. He's also written on measuring environmental quality in Asia, which is I consider to be the most comprehensive book on, on environmental indicators, uh, a new area. Um, and he's also written a book called America's Water, which is pretty much must reading for all of us. Currently, he's working on three books, one on sustainable development, uh, comes out of a course that he's been teaching with Kazai Jalal. And he also has a book on the water crises myth or reality, which actually is in press as, as we speak. His, uh, another book underway is Water Resource Development, Recent Trends in the Decision-Making Process. In addition to his books, of course, as an, a typical academic, he's written a lot of articles, and I would say mo many of his articles that I'm familiar with deal with uh, problems in water and environmental systems analysis. Of course, in his case, uh, you know, engineers are usually used to defining systems as sort of systems of uh, water supply reservoirs or, and such. But Peter works in, uh, in a much different scale, as you'll see tonight, more on the macro scale, dealing with the linkages between resource management models and macroeconomics. Uh, he's also worked in the area of socioeconomic uh, impacts of cl climate change, and, and I think his work in that area is somewhat analogous to tonight's work because his lecture tonight, because it challenged the consensus view. I've also seen some recent articles on, on the virtual flow of water, which I think you'll hear a little bit about tonight. He has numerous honors, uh, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a 20th Century Fund Fellowship. He was a Moss White Fellow at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, for the water resource engineers among us. 
He also was a, a commissioner of the World Water Commission for the uh, Water for the 21st Century, measure, member of the Technical Advisory Committee for uh, Global Water Partnership, and he's been all over the globe as a consultant to Indi the governments of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, uh, Morocco, Costa Rica, and, uh, and numerous, uh, UN, numerous international agencies, including UN, World Bank, USAID. As a water resource engineer, I feel proud to have Peter as a colleague, to call him a colleague. He's confronted social, political, and economic and the technical aspects of water problems on local, regional, and even global levels. And, and furthermore, he continues to challenge the consensus view on a, variety, a wide variety of fundamental problems, and I think you'll see that, that tonight. It is my honor to introduce Peter Rogers and his lecture, <coughs> Global Water Crises, Myth or Reality. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for that uh, introduction. I hope I can live up to just a small part of what he was promising you uh, tonight. Um, while this device is being adjusted, it was nice to walk into the reception here and see a huge, more than life-size photograph of one of my recent PhD students who is on the faculty of the Sloan School here. This is Fiona Murray, who fled uh, environmental engineering for, um, for business. Um, <laughs> and she did it because I think her starting salary was like twice as much as my current salary, but <laughs> there we have it. Okay. Um, I want to thank the uh, Boston Society of Civil Engineers and MIT for inviting me to present this lecture. Uh, it's a great honor to be asked to present it, uh, particularly from a professor from a nearby college more known for interesting genetic studies than for engineering. Um, I'm flattered to be chosen to honor the memory of a great hydraulic engineer, John Freeman, and as we'll see from some of my slides, nothing lasts forever, and poor old John's uh, dam in Ptolemy River in uh, uh, Yosemite National Park is under sustained attack by environmentalists who want to get rid of the whole Het uh system. Uh, so you win some and you lose some. His dam on the Charles River is, I think, greatly appreciated by the people who live upstream. Uh, otherwise, the MIT would have some nice mud flats uh, outside of it instead of this nice bucolic sailing arena you have. Um, I don't have a complete list of the Freeman lecturers, but I do notice that of the illustrious presenters in the past 18 years, six have been professors at MIT, none from Harvard. Uh, <laughs> could this be a subtle genetic effect? That's what I was wondering. Um, anyhow, I have a lot of material to cover this evening, and I want to use it in an effort to either support or confront your opinion about the global water crisis. So let me get started. Uh, with this thing. Obviously, a good place to start is ancient Rome. Uh, some of these things last. Uh, the Cloaca Maxima is still in use. Um, a very bad engineering decision from an economic point of view, but actually it's, uh, it's nice. And those fishermen know the best place to fish. Uh, the, uh, the outfall of a sewer is the best place for catching fish. Uh, whether you eat them or not is another matter. Uh, five things that could cause a uh, global water crisis. Um, Global climate change is a big issue these days. Um, rapid population and economic growth. Increased demands for irrigation for water, for food. Increased demands for urban water supply. Uh, restoration of environmental flows is a big issue for the could cause us to have a crisis if we decided collectively, although I think this is highly unlikely, to actually put some water back into the environment and not use it for homo sapiens. Um, Transboundary conflicts, which typically relate to just a couple of countries, however, can get to be very big issues if some of those countries have nuclear weapons, and uh, it could ruin our afternoons uh, for some time if, if, uh, if these countries don't work out ways of dealing with their transboundary conflicts. And then policy deadlock is probably the most important uh, thing that could cause a global water crisis. That we, we, the whole water governance issue is extremely badly handled, and I will come back to that. Okay, um, it's an old story, and what can we do? Huge needs, over one billion people without safe drinking water, uh, two billion with, more than two billion without sanitation, uh, four billion without sewage treatment uh, access or for the, the disposal of their waste. 
uh, existing systems are run down, and that goes for the United States uh, and as well with the rest of the world. Uh, needs in developing and transition economies up to $50 billion, years, $50 billion a year, or 1% of the G GDP uh, for the uh, global GDP. Um, and then no money. Uh, um, fiscal constraints, uh, aid is stagnant, uh, World Bank, uh, it had been $3 billion a year, went down to $1 billion. It's coming back up again in the water area. Um, the uh, public utilities are unable to self-finance or to carry debt. Private investment is a relative trickle so far and is for a whole series of good and bad political uh, reasons. Uh, diminishing resources, water availability, climate change, growing pollution, uh, world population, uh, and this is from some of the World Bank data, inadequate water supply in 1995 and 2025. It goes up dramatically if we carry on doing what we're doing. Uh, so keep in mind, over 1 billion uh, people without safe water, 2.4 billion without access to adequate sanitation. And by the way, these numbers are used all the time. I'm not sure where they come from. I don't think anybody's really sure where these numbers come from. But if you repeat the numbers often enough, they sort of take on a, it sounds like a billion, you know, that's a good number. Uh, <clears throat> 2.4 billion. I mean, and there, is, there are serious problems in definition of adequate and improved and all of these things which lead us into serious problems. We'll come back to that later. 10% uh, of the world's food is grown with water from aquifers which are being depleted faster than the rate of recharge. So that there's a lot of irrigation which is not sustainable. And in the next 30 minutes, about 180 children in developing countries Six children per minute will have died from disease caused by unsafe water. And I've been in many meetings in, in Washington and New York, and people are now saying we don't want the dead babies. Uh, keep the dead babies out of the discussion. That's, that's too difficult to deal with. But certainly, uh, when we look at the, um, at the statistics, uh, some of these are absolutely mind-boggling. This is uh, from some recent World Health data, and this is just deaths of, by age and cause for children uh, zero to four years, and this is for the, uh, this is for the globe, the whole world, and you see malaria, uh, diarrheal diseases, and respiratory infections. And, and, the, and the dead baby uh, argument is being used by people in, interested in air pollution and um, things like that because they say, wow, look at this, we're doing as well as you guys are, uh, we're doing even better. So the argument about uh, which should get the funding uh, is, is, is interesting. But issues like malaria, which is connected with the water, uh, and the management of water in many cases. But you see, in, that's the total for the globe. For the uh, high mortality developing countries, uh, it's a lot of the deaths happen in those. The developing countries which have already gotten control over uh, some of the diseases, so for instance malaria, still have a large percentage of the population, although the deaths are a lot smaller. So there's some numbers that people sort of think they have a good handle on. Um, a lot of discussion about shortage, scarcity, and stress. And again, the literature is full of different definitions of these things, and um, it's very hard to make any sense out of them. But generally speaking, uh, we're talking about uh, you need about 2,000 uh, cubic meters per capita for sustaining a, a life at some reasonable level. And it's not that you're going to drink that water, but the point is that you need about 1,700 um, meters cubed per capita for uh, food, growing food. That's, that's the need of water. About 100 or uh, so for, uh, about 200 for uh, municipal and in, uh, industrial uses, and about 100 for domestic uses. So you can see that when you're down to 1,700, the, the, the situation is stressed. Uh, countries, uh, chronic water scarcity down to uh, less than 1,000, some are beyond the water barrier. This is Mullen Falkenmark's uh, uh, um, categorization. Now, the problem with those is that when you actually um, look at different countries, you'll find some countries that seem to be doing very well at very low levels of per capita uh, water supply. So countries like uh, Kuwait and Israel and, and uh, countries like that, don't the, the water barrier doesn't seem to be of major problem to them. And we'll come back to that issue. This is a, a diagram from Malin Falkenmark, and it, 
It's, it's a map of the globe showing annual precipitation and annual evaporative demand. The blue is where the excess is greater than 1,000 millimeters, and the red is where the deficit is less than 1,000. And you'll see that there's large parts of the world where there's plentiful uh, precipitation in excess of evaporation. This is if you're thinking about growing crops. Of course, not going to be growing a lot of crops up here uh, unless you read um, what is a collapse by Jared Damond about the, the nice warm period they had in the 14th, 12th century along this coast over here. But generally, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of moisture. And you see in the uh, central parts of the globe, the low latitudes, that you have huge deficits. And, and you have deserts, and you have Australia, and places like that. But this is a, a way of characterizing. You'll see lots of, in the literature, you'll see lots of maps that show things like that. Okay. Uh, anyhow, this, so what I'm saying is, that don't panic. Okay, we've we've got this is my favorite book is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and unfortunately, they've made a movie of it, and I'm terrified to go and see the movie because it'll probably ruin the whole thing. But I like this other one. Help is on the way. Remember November second. Uh, <laughs> we're still waiting. Uh, but help is coming in the variety of forms, uh, some of which maybe Jeff Sachs is going to give us. Uh, but uh, this is the, the Millennium Development Goals, which in the, the year 2000, everybody in the UN agreed that these were the goals. And there are a lot of them, and it's hard to read this thing. But they have basically agreed that... Uh, to uh, halve the proportion of people without access to potable water. Since then, they've added half the number of people who don't have access to adequate sanitation. So that, there's, there's a, a serious commitment expressed by the United Nations and all of the countries that they're going to uh, do both of those things, which uh, heavily Im involve the water sector. And the uh, issue of food on this one also uh, is heavily related to how the... Um, I guess the irrigation works on, on the, on the, uh, in the water sector. Okay. Let's take a look at the U.S. for a moment. Um, withdrawal and consumptive use. Okay. Well, first of all, forecast is not destiny, thank God. Um, and this is a picture that was in my book, America's Water. And this is uh, the actual best estimates of the withdrawal of water, which is from the USGS, and they do put out every uh, 10 years, they put out a, um, a report which talks about the thing. And 1975 here was one point uh, which I was looking at, and I was looking at, in that period, forecasts that were made not by third grade students, but by colleagues of mine, uh, people at Resources for the Future, people from National Water Commission, people all of whom had good technical and economic educations. And it just shows how far off you can be. Uh, this is all of these projections. Now, somebody at the Water Resources Council who had a low projection was the closest, uh, or maybe somewhere in there. But this purple line is the actual. Okay, so, uh, you know, and this is by 75, people were predicting the need to build things like the Central Arizona Project, the Central Utah Project. We've got to get lots and lots of water because we need it all. We're all going to be running out of water, uh, things like that. And I think uh, this is um, a, a nice surprise. Uh, it's taken, however, most people in the United States a long time to notice this. And we still have lots of people out west who think that they're living in this world uh, out here. But this is what's actually happened. Uh, and again, actually happened means that's the best estimate that the U.S. Geological Survey can get. We don't know exactly what these numbers are. And I will play fast and loose with numbers, you know, a couple of billion gallons a day here and a couple of billion gallons a day there. You know, these are the sort of the limits, the range of accuracy of these estimates. Uh, but here's another way of looking at this thing. And this is uh, four different things, or, uh, three different things on the graph with two axes. So. Uh, they have to bear with me on this. But this one shows the population of the United States from 1950 to 2000, and the population's been going up and up and up, and it's, you know, it'll keep on going for a good, goodly time. This is the GDP of the United States, which is sort of going up. These are in constant dollars, by the way, so we, we, we're all getting richer. So some people are getting richer. I don't know where they are. The, down my end of the, the Cambridge, <laughs> I don't notice it, but uh, somebody is. 
Uh, and look at the total water withdrawn, okay, and it peaked around here, and it's dropped down, and it's, it seems to have leveled off. And what we're seeing is a decoupling between resource use and economic growth and population growth, which is a good thing, right? And this is also true in energy uh, use, uh, that, that we've been able to make that break. And thing. Uh, the bottom figure shows the consumptive use, okay, and this is on the same scale as this withdrawal use, and you can see the actual consumptive use is a small, about 25% of the total. So where is, what's the difference? What's going on here? Well, we withdraw a lot of water for uh, electric power cooling. The thermal uh, cooling is the major withdrawal use of water, but also we withdraw a lot of use water for uh, agriculture, and a lot of that gets evaporated. And, and so that becomes consumptive use. So agriculture adds to the consumptive use, uh, but also, it's fairly inefficient in many places, so there's a lot of uh, withdrawn water which gets back into the system. But that's, uh, th that's the, the story in the United States, and, and you can say this is very heartening, that we stand a chance, much better chance of dealing with this than what would have happened in 1975 if the things had gone on at the same rate. Okay. Can this good news be applied to the rest of the world? Okay, that's also a question. Okay. What do we know? Peter Glick has... Uh, taking a look at this issue, and here he's showing now, again, the same sort of thing from 1960 to about 2000 here, uh, actual global water withdrawals. Now, actual, again, is that word that we have to be very careful about because we don't know that number, but it seems to be around about there. But you can see at different points in time, people have made projections for what the future demand would be. And, of course, if you're dealing with water and dealing with large water projects, these are about the lead times that one typically thinks of. So we have to be a little bit cautious about what our engineers and hydrologists are telling us about what the demands may be in the future. So every case it's over, overshoot. So this is, this is also good news. Uh, now, in many countries, of course, uh, they don't have as much flexibility as we have for adjusting, but we'll come back to that later. Uh, question, is the water resource base, is it sustainable? Well, that's a good question. Um, is it? Well, this is a little schematic that we drew up, and it says these are all in 1,000 cubic kilometers of water. So these are large numbers. Uh, you know, again, if it, rained a thousand, if it rained a kilometer of water on your head, it would be very unpleasant. Uh, if you come from Manchester, England, you know what that means, right? It rains all the time. Uh, but the little boxes show the, uh, the stocks, and you see the interesting thing is where is all the water? on the globe. Well, all the water is in the ocean. And then the next biggest chunk of water is either in the glaciers or in deep groundwater, or in groundwater. So in lakes, there's some, but these are small. And in rivers, there's very little. Uh, you notice that the terrestrial water supply, the evaporation, is a huge part of the rainfall. So this, this, is, this is typically what we're dealing with. It also speaks a little bit to the issues of global warming, global climate change, what might happen to those glaciers. It, these won't bother us because they're like ice cubes in your scotch. The, the, the water level isn't going to increase. And unfortunately, the, the amount of scotch in your glass will not increase if the ice cubes melt. Uh, if we could do that, you know, MIT has very creative people. If they could do that, you, you'd feel terrific. But if you melt the glaciers on the land, you will notice something. But total ocean water, total terrestrial water. And this is a sort of a very gross balance. <coughs> but what I want to point out is the green and blue water. And this is a concept that Marlon Falkenmark has been pushing for 20, 30 years. And Marlon is a very determined a hydro Swedish hydrologist. And I, she finally convinced me that this is the right way to think about it. And she said, really, there is green and blue water. There's water comes in, and the green water is there, and it evaporates. And the blue water goes into the ground or goes into the streams and runs off. And the problem is that most of the hydrology that we talk about only deals with the blue water. And this gets us into serious trouble when we start doing water balances. Um, so this is a, an, an example of a water balance. <clears throat> this is from Postel, another 96. Again, they have a set of numbers slightly different from the ones that Peter Glick had in his 98 paper. But here I've sort of colored it green on this side and blue on this side and brown here because there are three types of water. There's the water that we've used, it's polluted, and trying to do a balance on this thing. 
total runoff, uh, total evaporation on land, 69,000 cubic kilometers per year. Total runoff in the streams, that get, that's groundwater, surface water, uh, 40 uh, cubic kilometers per year. And then a lot of that is in the remote areas. Some of it is in uncaptured uh, um, flood waters, okay? Uh, and then geographically av available water is about 12,500. So most people agree we have something like this. And this is the number which they use for the water that's available for use. But look over here, human appropriation of ET. We grow an awful lot of crops in rain-fed conditions. Uh, food and fiber produced uh, directly from this. It never gets back into the blue water system. And uh, so the questions about these numbers here, uh, you know, what is the human appropriation of the total um, renewable fresh water supply? Let's assume that we have this in some res reasonable steady state, uh, which could change, of course, with. Okay. But it, it raises this issue about water going to waste. And we hear it all the time. We see it all the time. Uh, people in Los Angeles talk about those rivers in Northern California that are going to waste. Um, in India, they're going to tie all the rivers together so no water will be wasted. Um, well, hello, guys. No single molecule of water on this planet is not currently actively employed doing something. I mean, we have to remember that, that the concept of going waste does not apply. What is involved is an allocation choice among users and potential users. And the choices between Homo sapiens and nature, and with the anthropogenic quota, there are several competing users again. So, but it's, it's, it's not as though there's a huge amount of water that's not being used. The question is, how do we make the allocation between us and them? And them don't vote. Uh, the, the birds and the bees and the, and the bugs and all of the other uh, species which live on this globe don't have too many votes. And so we tend to over allocate water like the, the classic example is Colorado River, which not only allocates all of the water in the river, but actually allocates more water than is in the river because <coughs> they, they made a mistake in the calculations uh, along the way. But that's okay. Uh, you know, if you can pass a, an act or form a compact, you can write those words down and you can sign a treaty. It doesn't mean to say that it's, nature is going to provide the water. And it, we have some problems there. But what's left after we've stolen everything we want is something called environmental flows. And that is a, a increasingly a major problem. Okay. What about climate change? This is one of the things that could change <coughs> uh, the availability of water and the variability. Well, this is a favorite uh, chart, and this is from the IPC third uh, report. Uh, and I like it because it says it's like Alice's Restaurant. And I showed that to my students, and they said, what is Alice's Restaurant? <laughs> And I knew I was in serious trouble. I knew it was time to retire, go and do something else. I mean, how can anybody not know about Alice's Restaurant? Well, you can get anything you want, and you can get anything you want from the IPCC reports. And I, and I think this is a whole bunch of things. Yes, the, the basis for these is shown in the report. And what I've done and what they have done in the report in various places, they've picked a couple of the, the uh, scenarios and, and looked at them in some detail. And this next slide is for 2050, I think, which is um, the uh, globe, again, in some projection or other. And this is a hard diagram to understand. And as we used to say at Harvard, this would separate the boys and the girls. But we're not allowed to say that anymore. Uh, no, only the president is allowed to say that. Uh, for the rest of us, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. This, this has got too much information on, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, this is December, January, February. This is June, July, and August. And this is scenario A2, and that's scenario B2. A2 is a slow decline in fertility and regional patterns of economic growth. And B2 is more rapid fertility decline and local economic solutions. So there are sort of middle scenarios from that previous slide. And you say, OK, let's see what it predicts about the precipitation in, um, in, that, in, that, in 2050. Okay. And you see that there's a fairly high agreement between the models when you're in the high latitudes and in the low latitudes, the large increase, small increase. But they're, they're both in the positive direction. But when you get in the middle latitudes, I defy anybody to, well, there's one that has sliding, small increases in all of them. But by and large, you get very, very confusing results. And these are two models. They're not extreme models. 
the models which are basically supposedly dealing with what will happen to the climate and what will happen to precipitation. And it says we're not in very good shape to address that question right now. Now, there's another um, uh, review, uh, uh, global climate IPCC report coming out soon, and maybe they've gotten a little bit further, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, okay. Which will have a greater impact, climate change or economic development? Okay. Uh, Charles Forrest-Marty at uh, New Hampshire has done a really nice little paper on this in which he looked at three scenarios, okay? Uh, scenario one, he varied the climate using the Canadian Climate Center GCM. And again, there are many, many different uh, general circulation models which you can use. And the Canadian one is a pretty, it's a pretty good one. It's, it, it's sort of maybe a little bit more extravagant than, than some. Uh, but he fixed the magnitude and spatial distribution of the human population and water withdrawals at the 1985 levels. This one says, apply the projected water demands for 2025, but use runoff and discharge based upon contemporary climate. And this one says, let's change both climate and water demands. Okay. And this is based on a water balance model using 30 minutes of arc grids with 59,000 grid points around the thing. Obviously, Charles and his group are very good at doing uh, computer models or, or doing arithmetic because I would, uh, I don't think our end of Cambridge we'd like to deal with 59,000 uh, grid cells on, on anything. Uh, but this is the sort of thing that, that you get. This is where, and this is re relating the, uh, this is the sum of the domestic, industrial, and agricultural uses divided by the flow that's available according to the scenario, and this is in the base case. So red is, says that things are going to get much tighter. And blue says it's going to get a little bit worse, a little bit better. So you see that climate change only, you get things improving in some places and getting worse in other places. And they tend to get worse in the places that are already bad. Remember the first diagram, which showed those places where there was a deficit between precipitation and evaporation. If you look at only population change, then you get a big impact. So this is saying no climate change, but the, the population. And then you see all those places in the world where population is growing rapidly and uh, stressing the environment. And then you put population and climate change together and you get a map which looks significantly worse than that one or whatever. I mean, these are <coughs> very interesting um, uh, experiments that he runs. Now, conclusions are not that easy for those because uh, clearly if we bumped off a lot of people, uh, are we allowed to say that? We, we, we reduced the population size. <laughs> Uh, by maybe a small thermonuclear exchange or something, uh, we wouldn't be demanding so much stuff. But I'm not recommending that. I'm saying that we can, I still think we can get through the next 25 or 50 years with what we've got if we're smart about it. So that's what I want to convince you of. You may come away not believing me. Um, is it a surprise that China is experiencing water shortages? Well, is it? That's population of China since we started that. Uh, the, the, in the modern convention, zero, year zero, all the way up to the year 2000. And you see China was doing pretty well for a long time, or doing badly, whichever way you view this. And all of a sudden, boom. And boy, they notice that they're having water shortages. They're in a very serious problem about water. They have serious problems about pollution. Uh, this should not surprise anybody. Uh, and it shouldn't surprise anybody about what's happening in the rest of the world. World population and the trend between the north and the south is developed countries and the developing countries is a huge shift in terms of the relative size of the population. And who knows where it's going to go to in 2020, 2025. Nine billion. Uh, I remember when it was three billion, okay, and even less. When it, when it was less, I wasn't paying much attention to it, but certainly, uh, and I don't think I added an awful lot to that. Uh, I'm the eighth of nine children, however. Uh, so somebody in my family must have been doing something to get that curve to uh, whatever. Um, but not me. Uh, and I'm sort of glad they did, actually. Uh, all, all things considered, uh, I'd rather be here than wherever else it might have, I might have ended up. So. so there are lots of things. OK, population. But let's take a look at two countries, Egypt and Korea. And these are generally countries which we don't think about in the same breath, on the same table in the World Bank's uh, 
uh, annual reports and, and things, we, we see them quite separate. But if you look back to 1950, Korea had a uh, Egypt had a population 20 million, uh, Korea had a population of 20 million, okay, almost identical. Look at this, the per capita income in Egypt was almost twice as high as the, the per capita income in Korea. Uh, water availability, about the same, and serial self-sufficiency, almost identical. So these countries in 1950 were about the same. Turn the clock forward to 1995, and we can check the numbers and maybe get even more up to date. One, 62.93 million, 44.9 million. Per capita income, 790. It's gone up. They're better off than they were. They're significantly better off than they were. But look at these guys, 9,700. Uh, water for agriculture, this has gone down because they're demanding water for other sectors in Egypt. But the water available for agriculture, the water used for agriculture is significantly less in Korea. And cereal self-sufficiency, that's in Egypt, that's the amount of food they produce at home, 63%. It's about the same. And this is uh, only 34%. And, and these are made up by imports. Egypt exports cotton and brings in grain, okay, which is a smart thing to do. Uh, but you, you think about this thing. It, it, you're not tied to the disasters which you see happening. You're not tied to the the Chinese uh, version, and the Chinese themselves are not tied to it anymore. They decided that they want to do something different. Um, Kuznets uh, died before people started using the Kuznets curves. That was convenient because, you know, he couldn't object uh, to the thing. But the Kuznets curve is a, a trap door, a, a wiggle way out of lots of our problems. And this is the water in cubic kilometers uh, based, this is US data. and. Uh, this is, we fitted a nice quadratic curve to it. It is the data don't look like that. This is a curve, which even I could fit. I did this. I'm very proud of it. Um, <laughs> but you see that when the per capita income was low and is low, then the, the demands go up, and then at some point, and then it starts going down. And this, uh, a bunch of studies done by the World Bank show this holds for most of the uh, resource use and environmental. Uh, insults. It doesn't seem to work for solid wastes, however. Solid wastes seem to just keep on going up. And the more money we have, the more waste we seem to like to produce. But this is a, a, an interesting thing. It says if you, if you have resources, you don't just keep on using water inefficiently. You do other things. And, and in fact, you might actually start to do manufacturing and import virtual water. Okay, and we'll get to that. Agricultural water is a big issue. Uh, why? Food security. Irrigation produces one third of the food from one sixth of the cropland. Losing irrigation land by 30% in 2025 and 50% in 2050, we lose that because of the salinization of the soils. We, again, we don't have to do it, but it's expensive and you have to be fairly clever to make those systems work. And it's very hard to reclaim them once they get salinized. Uh, in the LDCs and low de less developing countries, only 2% of the irrigated land is mechanized and it's 32% in the U.S. 50% of the people depend on world markets for food. And this is the interesting thing. This is currently what's happening. And lots of people get very unhappy when you talk about virtual water. And virtual water, I mean, the, the, the world system wouldn't work without virtual water. This is what's actually happening right now. And th this is what always bothers me. Well, when people sort of say, we're not ready to discuss this, well, you know, too bad, it's already happening. Okay. Where does all the water go? Well, this is a favorite thing, and it is McGraw Hill. Uh, it was in the textbook. Uh, it's 2,000 tons of water to produce a ton of grain. Okay, and think about it. And, and this is why virtual water is so important. Um, my wife doesn't like this picture because she get, gets the wrong impression as to what you're getting out the back end of the cow. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of the, the energetics of the system, uh, you get 10, for 100 kilograms of grain, you get 10 kilograms of, of cow, and you get one kilogram of people from that. Whereas if you go on to the, you stay on a, on a grain-based diet, then you get 10 kilograms of people. So uh, this is clearly, from a water point of view, this is much more efficient. But this is not what's happening around the world. In fact, as people get more and more income, they demand more and more of the cow, or whatever the equivalent is. And this is uh, one of the interesting stories which is happening right now. And it's happening in China, certainly, but also in India. I mean, India, the bastion of 
um, vegetarianism is actually lapping up Big Macs and Kentucky Fried Chicken and everything else as rapidly as the rest of the world. Okay, virtual water flows and trade liberalization. Well, um, agricultural protection and trade liberalization, important issues. Um, we have uh, the, um, now it's actually less than a billion dollars a day subsidies for agriculture by uh, the, the OECD countries. So the rich countries uh, protect their agriculture to the tune of about a, a billion dollars a day. And to think about that, that, that's done at the cost of farmers in the rest of the world who have to compete against heavily subsidized crops from these things. And we have the World Trade Organization, and we're always talking about doing something about that, but uh, it's a question of who goes first. This is in one case in which the United States isn't quite as bad as the Europeans. Uh, we're much worse than in many cases, but certainly uh, on the agricultural subsidies and protection of their agriculture, the Europeans are ferocious. Um, some interesting um, publications put up at the French Ministry of Agriculture if you want to see fantasy land at work. Um, food production security, a lot of people say uh, you have to produce your own food because it's insecure. And I always say I'm from Massachusetts and we don't produce our own oil. And we could do fairly well with our food, but during the winter you need oil and you can't survive without oil. So tell me about it. Uh, you know, we, we import all our own oil. Um, and so the issue of trade and the security of the supply and things, and it's a big issue in many countries. It was not helped along by Henry Kissinger, remember? He's like uh, Alice's restaurant, right, Henry Kissinger. Uh, he, uh, he did say what during the, there was a big uh, world uh, um, famine conference in 1974 in Rome, and Henry suggested that as a retaliation for the 1973 fracas over the um, uh, oil embargo, that we could have a food weapon. And so uh, it's sort of ridiculous because actually the supply of food comes from a variety of countries, and I don't think we could pull it off. But, but it didn't help a lot of people. It led to some very bad policies. Trade in embodied water is what we're talking about here. And is it big? It is very big. This is the net virtual imports in cubic kilometers. Uh, Jorge and I did this, so it isn't a very nice graphic, but also, the reds, the, the negatives means that you're exporting and the positives mean you're importing. But you see that in Alaska doesn't ever export that much. It just happens to be part of the United States. And, and somehow or other, the, the map colored it red. Okay. Uh, but you see that uh, the United States and Brazil and Argentina uh, export a lot of water. These are in, this is 100 cubic kilometers of water exported from the United States every year. Uh, Russia imports a lot. Okay, Russia, if you looked at those other maps, Russia is one of the countries in the world with the most available water, uh, but seemingly the least available uh, institutions and government agencies that can actually make any sense. So uh, what you have is they import uh, a lot. They don't have to, but lots of other places in the world are importing. So you've got exporters and importers. And um, the numbers on this, there was the, uh, in Sweden two years ago, they had some meetings about this. and there were a variety of estimates on how much the current trade regime, um, how much water people didn't have to use in order to get grain. 840 cubic kilometers uh, globally, uh, 630, 1,000. And I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about how close Oki and you know, Jorge and I are. But we sort of, you know, a lot of the, the same data is used in these things. So maybe we should have all got the same answer. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's around about that. Uh, what we did was we said, well, what happened if we did away with all the trade and uh, tariff problems? And we just assumed there was free trade in, 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 in the world. And, and what happens is that the, global, the trade actually doubles in size. And there's uh, going to be this amount for animal products and this amount for cereals. So it's, the amount of cereals will probably remain the same, but the amount of animal products will embedded water in that because animals take a lot more water to produce than uh, grain and you know that because uh, they eat grain and they eat grain and they metabolize and they use it up and you saw those earlier pictures so this is the sort of thing which says that the global food trade would actually double now some of these things would change uh, different places but certainly 
one of the big winners in terms of liberalization of trade will be the United States of America. And that's something which I always find hard to follow in the congressional debates and all of those senators from those states that have you know, one congressman and two senators all seem to be determined to protect and keep the protection out when in fact they could be doubling their uh, export possibilities by liberalizing trade. But it's a little bit of who goes first on this. But we've actually had an experiment. You see, this is all of this other stuff we say, you know, liberalize trade, we'll do this, take those off. But we actually did it, okay? And there's an interesting result. This is exactly what Jorge and I are predicting actually happened, okay? This is, this, this is, of course, Jorge is a Colombian, so you use commas instead of points for decimal points. I mean, you know, third world problems, right? Is that we've got to get the decimal point. And maybe they'll start using Fahrenheit when, when we use, when, uh, but there we have it. You know, this is, this is the trade in, in average between 93 and 94, and then in 2001, 2002, and you'll see that it speeds up, and, and there's, we've about doubled what we export to, to Mexico. So this is a demonstration of an actual experiment, and it's hard to run experiments like this. Now, some people will say that's not really free trade, and there's all sort of hanky-panky goes on, but certainly something is happening between this and this, and, and it certainly imp impacts on the thing. Okay. Um, urban water supply and sanitation, uh, typically uh, poor population of villages within cities. Uh, in New Delhi, 40% of the population don't have access to sanitation that you would recognize as such. Um, and so it's, they live in little busties all over the place, uh, which, um, which when I was living in Delhi, they weren't there, but they've come, back, come up in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, 15 of the top 20 megacities, that's 10 million, more than 10 million globally, will be in poor countries by uh, 2015. And in fact, in Bangladesh, they are expecting the population of Dhaka to reach 22 million uh, by 2015. And I remember when I first went to Dhaka, and I'm not a thousand years old, okay, the population was 385,000 people. I was there just recently, and I've, it's about 14, 15 million. And it's about the same infrastructure and, you know, sort of everything else. It's really tough. Um, but certainly the uh, growing water demand is in, impacted by the urbanization which is going on. Uh, what about non-agricultural use of water? This is a nice little diagram. This is from Marlon Falkenmark, and I like these big trucks. Uh, and this is what we use in the U.S., and this is what they use in Europe, and this is what they're using in Africa, and this is how it's split between household use, service use, and industry. And... Uh, you know, you need smaller water trucks in Africa. Um, but, you know, I, I have lots of European friends. I go there all the time. And they have showers and they have toilets and they eat well and live well. Uh, they just don't seem to, they're not with it on using water. Um, okay, I won't, won't spend your time going through, but there are lots of problems with the definitions of adequate versus improved, which influence the next set of numbers, which this will cost a lot, right? We're talking about those 1 billion without water and the 2.4 billion without sanitation. Uh, okay, in order to cover the Millennium Development Goals, let's think about this in practical terms. To meet the goal by 2015, you have to add coverage of water, adequate uh, potable water to 280,000 people per day and 567,000 persons per day from now until 2015. Now, how long did it take us to build the the big dig, and it's not finished yet. And it's a, I mean, we're talking about monumental numbers, which they're around the globe, but how are we going to do this? I mean, so this is, we've all agreed that we're going to do this. Okay, this is an agreement. Uh, fortunately, we generally don't get sent to jail if we don't obey the UN commitments that we have. Otherwise, we'd be in serious trouble because I don't see how we can do it. What will it cost? Okay. Uh, the numbers vary all over. Price Waterhouse came up with a nice number, $180 billion a year. A global Water Partnership, that's my outfit, we came out with a modest $30 billion, uh, and we think maybe an additional funding of about $15 billion a year would maybe give us a chance to get somewhere close to that. Okay, but those are, not, those are big numbers compared to what? Okay, it's always the Johnny Carson question, you know. That's bad, but, oops. You know, compared to what? <laughs> uh, what are the dimensions of the water supply and sanitation problems in the U.S.? This is familiar to most of us. We sort of live here. 
Uh, most utilities for both water and wastewater have problems covering the cost of services. So there's the, this is the GAO did a report in 2002. It's a wonderful report. You should read it. Uh, many have deferred maintenance due to capital shortages. So what we do is we don't fix things. We just let things deteriorate. Uh, about half of these 55,000 drinking water systems and 20% of the wastewater are privately owned. Most of these serve populations less than 10,000 where they can't get the funding and financing and the maintenance goes to hell on those first. Uh, estimated investments between 300 billion and 1 trillion would be needed over the next 20 years. This is, this is the compared to what thing. This is in a situation where we have, you know, we've, we're very proud of the fact that you flush the toilet and the water goes somewhere. Uh, in Boston, but in order to keep that going, we're going to have to uh, put up some real cash. These costs apparently don't include the cost of evolving stormwater regulations, estimated between 23 billion and 170 billion for, for Los Angeles Water Board over the next 20 years. And that's in Los Angeles now, I used to say it only rained 10 days a year, but I think it rained for about a month uh, earlier, so God knows what they're doing with all that water. But look at the cost of those, that's the wastewater. Uh, the, the drain, storm drainage, and I don't know what we're going to do in Boston. I mean, uh, there are experts here. I know we had a, uh, a talk on it uh, last year, two years ago. But certainly, these are very expensive items, and they're not included in that 300 to tri 1 trillion. Um, during the past year, about 7 billion per year was provided by federal and state resources, and a little bit by private sector. The recently, just I think last week, the American Society of Civil Engineers came out with a scorecard on infrastructure in the United States and water supply and sanitation got a D minus, okay. Uh, I don't think we're allowed to give a D minus anymore in my institution. I think the grades go from A to B plus, <laughs> or, <laughs> or something like that, I don't know. This is not in, to entice the MIT students to come to Harvard, by the way. Uh, but certainly we don't give D minuses, I've seen very few of those. Uh, but that's what we have in the United States, so compared to what is an important question. Um, and let me go quick. There, there is some estimates of by region, uh, and the number of people in, this is by 2020, uh, and the, the numbers of people in the different parts of the world, and, and the costs, about 27 billion uh, per capita, just to meet minimum standards, 27 billion per year, not per capita, that, uh, that would be excessive. Uh, but the reason is not to invest in water. And this is the big issue that people talk about is privatization and they keep on beating it to death, and I don't know any company that wants to go and invest in water. And in fact, if I was a shareholder in one of those companies, I would get out of that, I would sell my shares right away, because the, the average return on investments in water in these international cities is zero, okay? And zero is not a number that I can afford to live with as a shareholder and as a manager of one of those companies. So uh, you have this problem. And you see this, this is uh, degree of cost recovery, and this is from a World Bank study. Uh, in the uh, late uh, 1990s, early, early 2000. And 100% is financial autonomy, so telecoms are good things to invest in. Gas is not so good because you have a lot of government in, fooling around in those, and power in many cases. And if you've got regu un, un, unregulated, as we have in the United States, then it might be good to invest in. But water comes in way down there. Nobody in their right mind would invest in water. Okay, and you see this in the Asian Development Bank put out a wonderful document on water supply and, and sanitation in Asia. And this is for the annual investments in revenue collection. Uh, and this is in 2002. And these are in millions of dollars. And this is of the various cities. And the interesting thing is the green, how much revenue did you get? And the others are, how much did you spend? And you notice that uh, Shanghai did pretty well on uh, revenue collection, but it also spent a lot. So this is not something. In no case, this one case, the uh, where is that? Uh, um, Kuala Lumpur, or one of those, anyhow, has actually got the revenue is pretty close to the expenditure. So that looks like a, a nice break even type of thing. But this is the situation. So those are the reasons not to invest. The reasons to invest are let, look at the economic and social benefits, don't focus on the costs. And I think this is part of the problem with the Millennium Development. Um, goals and the discussions which are happening next week in the Commission on Sustainable Development, everybody talks about the cost. And what we need to do is talk about the benefits. And the benefits are large, and I won't go through this one thing. But here's some work again by the World Health Organization done last year. 
and they looked at the benefit cost ratios for investments in uh, uh, water and sanitation. Uh, and you benefit cost ratios, when you include the social effects, the health effects, uh, the lost time in, in, uh, in being sick and things like that, and these are colossal, 8.7. There aren't other investments you can make in those countries that have benefit cost ratios of anything like those, those numbers. I mean, 2.8 may be one, but this is 23, 9, 8.7. So I think we're looking in the wrong direction for the investment in water. Now, how much do we pay for water? This was in uh, this year, not so long ago, in the wonderful little uh, US Water News. It's one of those throwaway newspapers full of information. And yes, indeed, Boston is not the most expensive water in the country. I always told everybody it was, but there are other people who are paying actually more. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Huntington, West Virginia, all of these are in the very wet part of the country, of course. Um, places that don't uh, pay much for their water, uh, some of them, I don't have the other ones, but the Miami is one. Uh, US average is about here. So um, what we're talking about, $2.26 2 per 1,000 gallons. You include the cost of sewer, it's about 5.54. So Boston is right in there uh, on, on that. Um, so, you know, this, this is, uh, but are we covering our costs with those? That's the question. Uh, but you have to think about alternative investments. And the one that I think is most interesting is the Tampa Bay desalination. Now, Tampa Bay has gotten some bad press recently because they didn't design the filters well enough and they're clogged. But they have a $110 million uh, plant for 25 million gallons a day. I went online in 2004. It was closed for a while because they, they have to correct the filter clogging problems. And they hadn't. This is the low tech part of the process as opposed to the high tech part. This is, what always happens is you get, you, you get lost in your high tech. Uh, a whole bunch of companies went bankrupt in this, uh, this thing, including Stone and Webster in Boston. Uh, we'll go online from 206, producing water for $2.54 per 1,000 gallons, 67 cents per cubic meter. And it, if, if everything goes according to plan, it'll drop to 47 cents per cubic meter within 30 years. The interesting thing is here that the production cost is car comparable to average U.S. water prices. So what, and U.S. water prices are a lot lower than water prices around the world. So what you're seeing is there is a get out of jail free card uh, called desalination because most cities have access to some form of desalination. Uh, let's, let's move quickly through this. Environmental flows, we talked about uh, that as what was left over. Uh, and the one place in the world where they seem to be doing the most serious work on this is in the Murray-Darling in Australia. And they have a growth, they have a cap and trade system. And this is the, it came into effect in 1994. And this is the growth in diversions. And then they capped it at this and they allowed trading. Um, they've run into problems in Australia. And here's, this is the sort of thing, this is the natural conditions. This is sea and coastal, this is the amount of water going to those river, river in environment, coastal environment. That was then, this is now, big chunk going to irrigation. And the question is, is this sustainable? They, they thought that the cap would do it, but they've had a drought for a few years and they're in serious trouble. Now, going back to the issue of who votes, uh, the Australian, uh, seeing the farmers have the rights to the water, and that irrigation water, so they're not going to do anything with it, but they can sell it. So the taxpayers in Australia are buying water for the environment. And, and there have been cases like this in, in parts of the United States where not so, mu not so obvious where we've taken water from some groups and given it to the environment. But certainly this is a, uh, an interesting case, but it certainly uh, has not solved the problem. Uh, this is Delta of the Colorado River in June 2002. This is uh, the, the, the salt wetland. The whole thing used to be a big, uh, well-developed estuary. And of course, by not putting much water down there, um, you don't get much. OK, um, let me wrap up um, important concepts of economics. And pricing is important, because we know that people don't pay enough for water, so there's a potential for demand management by pricing. There are three things to remember, cost, value, and price. Now, most of the literature gets this all mixed up because, because classical economic theory has all of these things meeting marginal cost equals the price. And you don't have to worry about it. Well, that's not the case. Um, and the value, of course, is its value in use, and that would also be at that same point. 
Uh, that's a different planet than we live on. Uh, but the general principles look something like this. And this is full supply cost to so operation maintenance, capital cost, opportunity cost of the water that could have gone to higher uses, economic uh, externalities, things that directly impact other users downstream, and then environmental externalities, public health and things like that. And so when we talk about things, we're talking about full supply cost. And there's a lot of confusion because uh, institutions like the World Bank talk about full supply cost, and they're talking about this, which is capital and operation maintenance. But in many cases, for irrigation, they only charge operation and maintenance, so that the actual uh, economics is pretty screwed up. Uh, I don't think we can ever estimate what the full cost is, but we have a pretty good chance of estimating full economic cost. And on the benefit side, we have the value and use to the user, net benefits from uh, return flows, net benefits for alternative uses, so people, other users in, in the system who can, like women can wash their clothes in irrigation canals and things like that. Uh, and then the, uh, the intrinsic value up at the top, and nobody's going to tell me what that number is, but this would be full value and this would be uh, the, some lesser value, uh, that would be the economic value. And so we have a way of looking at those things and trying to estimate them. Uh, Ramesh Bhatti and I tried to do this for the Subraneka River Basin in India where the water is used for irrigation, for uh, municipal use, and for uh, industry. And this is the, um, the, thing, the value, the value in use, okay? This is the cost of supply, and this is the tariff, okay? This is what the charge. So clearly, the value is much less than the, than the cost, and is way, uh, the cost is way above the, above the tariff. And so for uh, um, municipal uses, that's the value in use. It's much more valuable use than, than, um, than agriculture, and the cost is less. It's easier to supply, but the tariff is low. And the same sort of thing, the industry, the value in use is very high for industry, and the cost is about the same as supplying the the uh, municipal uh, users, and the tariff they had set was this. Now, uh, this looks like a wonderful opportunity for cross-subsidies. That It doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't only charge that. Maybe that's all the farmers can afford, but you could certainly work out some cross-subsidies between industry and, uh, and the other users that would make the investment in uh, water supply uh, cost-effective or uh, attractive to investors. Okay. Um, Sustainable markets, I mean, this is, we talk about a lot of discussion of non-market systems and market systems. And this is a favorite picture of mine. This is Valencia's water court, which is an engravement. This is 1831 engravement. This is a photograph that was in Arthur Moss's book. Um, and you see that they're sitting on the uh, steps of the cathedral in Salamanca, I guess it is. Um, and they, this is a water court which is made up of irrigators. And everybody on the court has to be, every on the judges has to be an, an irrigator, a person who actually irrigates and, and, uh, in that area. And they rotate and they make the decisions. And the interesting things about this court is they don't keep any records. And, and this, is, this has been going since the 14th century. I mean, this has survived uh, kings and capitalists and communists and everybody. The, the, the people from Spain were telling me that the EU would like to close it down because the people in Brussels don't like uh, something that without a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, but these guys, they make the decisions and they trade and they swap water and they penalize farmers who misbehave. And it's all done by this group of judges who sit on the steps of the cathedral and uh, every Thursday morning and, and make the decisions. So this system works. It's, it's a system which is sustainable. It's been there for centuries and it's survived a lot of accidents. Here's another system, okay? This is capitalism at work. Now, this is uh, in Colorado. And here are two cowboys, and these must be the enforcers for the market. This is somebody who wants to, um, what is it? He wants to, one of them wants to sell, and he wants to sell at $6,000 per share. And this guy wants to buy, and he wants to buy 50 shares for $8,000 or something. Clearly, the tatonment has not yet worked. Uh, there's going to be a lot of negotiation. But they do trade water in this. This is a market at work, actual Real-life market, you know, as you can see it. What you can't see is the six shooters they have on the desk uh, to enforce because markets don't work unless you have enforcement. You can't have a contract with no fulfillment. 
the, the Spanish ones are because everybody's lived there for five centuries and they know each other and they can break their legs later at nighttime if they misbehave. Uh, but certainly there's, uh, it, the markets do work. Uh, so they're sustainable. Some things are not, and these are the, the end pictures I have. Steamer on the lower Colorado. A, a steamer on the lower Colorado would have to have wheels on the bottom to, to go anywhere. This is a, not such a long ago photograph. And then this lady, I don't think she actually caught that fish, but this, she, <laughs> this is the size of fish that they used to have in the delta of the Colorado. There are none of those left. Big fish, gone forever. Um, okay, the main challenges, let me just wrap up now. Um, securing water for people, securing water for food, developing job creation, protecting vital ecosystems, dealing with variable time and space, managing risks, creating popular awareness, forging political will, ensuring this is the sort of things that we have to do, the, the, the professionals, the technical people have to uh, see if we can do this. Okay, let's go back. Five things that could exacerbate the pending global water crisis. Well, transboundary conflicts, potential for good and evil. Uh, and you think about uh, Turkey and Syria and Iraq who are currently not agreeing on what to do about the water. Um, uncertainty of supply, intrinsic variability, and climate change. Continued rapid economic and population growth. I mean, if, if we have rates of population growth of magnitude that we saw in China, then it will make the situation much worse, uh, and particularly with, um, with uh, increase in income. Uh, restoration of environmental flows. What happens if we're forced by the collapse of aquatic communities to start diverting more water? I mean, that this, this could happen. And then the idiosyncrasy of water institutions. Effective water management prevented by poor governance, and that seems to be uh, the United States is a classic example of that. Um, however, you know, help is on the way. Uh, six things could mitigate the pending, okay. Blue, green, brown, water. Water moves from one state to another state. And, and the, we have a tremendous amount of slack in the green water system. We can go back and do a lot more on taking advantage of that evaporation to substitute for irrigated use of, of, of crops, for instance. Um, asymmetries in water use, irrigation flywheel. If you have a country that's been irrigating a lot, uh, like in Arizona where I was recently, people are watering their golf courses um, at midday with big fountains of water, They're doing a great job of evaporation. Uh, but uh, my friends from the University of Tucson tell me that, well, agriculture irrigation in, in uh, Arizona has dropped by about 50% in the last decade. So all of that water is being freed up for use or misuse in, in, in the cities. They could have put it back in the river and sent it to Mexico, but that's not in the nature of the things. Uh, so the asymmetry in water use, if you've got a lot of irrigation, it's a big flywheel, you can use some of that. Virtual water escape hatch, okay, lets you get out of jail card free. That if you need more food, you can import it, if you can figure out how to become a player in the trade game. Um, Low-cost desalination breaks of coastal cities have an unlimited supply of potable water. Now that depends upon energy. So we've, it's pushing the dirt around under the rug. We don't have a water problem if we have energy. And you know, um, if you live in California and, and, and you eat uh, goat cheese every morning, you think that we're going to have solar distillation just around the corner, uh, you, you better eat a lot more goat cheese uh, on that. But certainly, uh, uh, you know, you, you want to hear a good tip, investment. The Canadians have uh, oil shales. They have more oil shales, uh, more oil in the oil shales than Saudi Arabia has, and they're now producing it for about $6 a barrel. So the Canadians are going to save us for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, so you heard that from me. Go out and buy stocks in those companies. It will increase the value of my stock. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Eco-sanitation revolution, I haven't talked about this, but you can decouple water and sanitation. You don't have to have a flush toilet. And um, there are lots of dry sanitation systems, and it's very hard to get them adopted in the developed world, although the, I've seen them working in Sweden, for instance, in apartment houses. Uh, but the Swedes are highly motivated people. Um, it would be hard to imagine that happening in Boston uh, with, with all sorts of shenanigans going on. Uh, but certainly th that, that you can decouple that and th that's a revolution which is happening and has to happen and will make the dealing with wastewater a lot easier to deal with. 
And water is universally underpriced. So there's a lot of potential for demand side management, I think, is, is the, the thing. Okay, which is more likely? And this is where I should stop now or I should say, never say never, okay? Uh, technical fixes always help, uh, but we already have had all of the technology that we need to survive in the next 20 to 50 years. And I say that uh, having done this book on water in the Arab world, and that was in 1987 or 1990, 1992 or something. And I missed the desalination breakthrough. I assumed, like everybody else, that desalination was gonna cost at the best about two or three dollars a cubic meter. And there was no way that we'd beat that. We even talked about second law of thermodynamics as though we knew what was going on. Now it's 47 to 67 cents a cubic meter. That makes a huge difference in that thing. So, you know, I'm admitting to being majorly wrong on, on, on one thing. You could never afford to uh, irrigate um, crops with it, but you could certainly irrigate other things. And one of the, the points I saw the other day was, uh, um, you know, and I asked my students, which is the largest crop in the United States? And of course, they all said marijuana, but it's actually lawns. We have 40 million acres of lawns of which we're putting about, uh, almost half of the water we consume is actually going onto lawns. And this is, I, I wouldn't have believed that except I was out in Arizona last week and I saw it actually happening. Um, but 30 million tons of fertilizer going onto those lawns and golf courses are even worse. Um, okay, what always appears to be limiting effect is the political will and effective institution to take advantage of these technologies. Okay, and then, so we end with Rachel Carson and she says, it's the rubber frost, you know, two roads, we have a choice. And the choice is ours to make. So, you know, there's my answer to the question that's posed at the beginning, uh, do we have a crisis or not? We could have a damn good crisis, or we could have a relatively benign way of getting through the next 50 years. I'm not writing guarantees. I'm not selling shares for longer than 50 years in this thing, and that's my grandchildren. Uh, so, but, but I think they'll all be a lot smarter by then and all of the things we've missed will be out there and, and running. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I talked, I talked for an hour, uh, which was a little bit longer than I was invited to talk. But, you know, we, seeing the only Harvard guy who's ever been invited down here, we ought to give a chance to say what's happening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Well, I'm not or? finished because he also agreed to answer questions for 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's a question here. Uh, you see water harvesting happening? <clears throat> well, you know, water harvesting is something which is a very big issue in countries like India, and it's been pushed by the Center for uh, Environment and Science. Um, the problem with water harvesting, it's you're moving the water around from one place to the other. So uh, the Indian government, for instance, is very upset that the farmers are getting together upstream and diverting the water and evaporating it during growing crops. And they say that water should go downstream and be in those reservoirs which will provide water for other people downstream. And, and you know, it's a, a good argument. It depends very much on how you define the property rights of water. Who owns the water? Who owns the rain? Most people assume that the rain falls on your land, it's yours. Uh, but if you're going to do water harvesting, you better make sure that the, the government isn't going to say, that's our water, you can't do this. And that's what's happening in India. And the government has been going around in various places, knocking down the water harvesting structures and saying, you can't do that, this water is ours. But it, it's, it's, it's water that's green water that is on its way to becoming blue water. If they're just going to take the green water, that would be okay. But I think that's the, the problem with it. So it looks like a, a wonderful solution, and the uh, Center for Science in, in, in India has written all these wonderful documents and talking about all these terrific things that happen in the upland reaches, and they're true. Absolutely. It's great. But it's a redistribution again. It's not redistribution from nature this guy, and it's a redistribution from the people downstream. So I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm with those people upstream. If I was living upstream, I would be using that because uh, I don't see what inherent rights those other people downstream have to the rain that somebody provides to land on my property or our property. 
So it, it is, it's, it's not a simple one because it looks like magic, and a lot of people think it's magic, got this extra water. We, we don't. It's water that's accounted for. There is no drop of water that's not accounted for. I mean, that's the problem. And it, you know, so question in the back. Well, I, what I was saying, or meant to imply, was <clears throat> if you look at the conventional business uh, of water sales, and, and you can see what happened in Argentina or in, uh, in Bolivia or in, in Manila, um, the governments have mishandled these institutions, the water supply, very badly. And they, they, they've even deteriorated even more than ours have in the United States. So the way to get out of that is to um, pass it on to some private companies and say, you know, we're not responsible for raising the cost of water. It's those guys, the French or the Americans or something. And it's, it's been disastrous in those cases. So the big, big um, water supplies that were, and I, you know, the, the, you can blame the, the, the water companies, the big multinational water companies for being greedy and that they should have known the things. And, and the Argentine case is a classic example of um, how not to do things if you're a sovereign government. You know, they wrote their contracts denominated in foreign exchange. That was in the days when we had dollarization of the peso. And uh, now I always talk about the pesoization of the dollar, uh, which is actually happening right now as we speak. Uh, but certainly, by tying everything to foreign exchange, then you get a, a crisis as they had in Argentina, which devalued the local currency. Then they ended up paying a huge fortune for water in foreign exchange terms. If it had been denominated in local currency, it would have been related to local supply, local labor conditions, and things like that. But it was even worse because the French companies write these contracts in that, that they have to, you have to use their suppliers. So even for parts and service, you have to use the, uh, the, the suppliers who come in at international prices. They don't come in at local prices. So you ended up with uh, massive lawsuits and uh, in cases in, uh, in Bolivia, the, the Bechtel walked away from it. The Philippines is in a real mess right now in, in Manila. Um, there are some places that have worked. Some of the French African countries have worked reasonably well. But by and large, the, the new big uh, systems have not been smart investments. But it doesn't mean to say investing in water is not a good thing to do, because if you look at the social benefits, and that's when I was showing the value side of the thing, when you start looking at the public health aspects, then the benefits are very large. But who is going to reap those benefits? It's not the international water companies. It's going to be the local government, the local population are going to benefit. The local industries are going to benefit from having people who show up for work and are not sick, uh, as for instance, the biggest issue is loss of time on, on that. So th that's what I meant with this is to, uh, and as I say, I wouldn't, if somebody, you know, tells me they're going to invest in some big water company somewhere, I'm not going to buy shares in that company unless there's some way of capturing those other benefits. Yeah. Question. My question is, uh, you talk about integrity for all the rivers in India. Yeah. Uh, and do you think I mean, that is the right way to add that? I know I would ask you that question. You're from India, right? Uh, what happens if you interconnect all the rivers in in the country and then you use all the water from those rivers? What's going to happen to the ecology? What's going to happen to? I mean, I think you know. I mean, this is the sort of thing when when I saw those plans, and the first time I saw those plans was not just recently. I saw those in 1967 when Captain Dastur flew over the Himalayas and said, let there be rivers flowing all over India. It was a crazy idea then, and it's a crazy idea now. The problem is that you had the government this time saying, let's do it. But I, from what I hear, that the government has backed off, and quite rightly so, because it is a, it's not an economical thing to do, never mind the ecological damage that would be done. So I, I might say I'm a little bit extreme on this, but 
you know, some of it is because the Chinese are going to connect their rivers. So India wants to be like the Chinese. You know, we're a big country, big powerful countries, and uh, look what the United States has done. It's connected all these things around, the plumbing systems everywhere. And so we want to do the thing. The Chinese have started on one of the connections, but that's the easy and cheap one. Uh, I don't think they'll ever build the connections and the, 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 the upstream ones from the Yangtze because they're going to take, have to take huge rivers through very high mountains. And even in China, the cost of doing that is, is, is very high. So I, I think this will die out, this interlinking of rivers. There will be some small connections and, and things, but by and large, I don't see it as a particularly given the other alternatives. I mean, the other alternatives are for the municipal water supply to use uh, desalination and to uh, try and think about uh, using rain-fed agriculture in a better way, uh, supplemental irrigation rather than total irrigation. Um, and, and, you know, and, and there are countries in the world like uh, Iraq, for instance, most of its uh, grain was grown in rain-fed conditions. In fact, in the Middle East, most of the grain that is grown is rain-fed. Uh, even Australia, the, you know, 10 or 12 inches of rain a year is a good amount of rain if you know how to deal with uh, the, the, the agriculture for arid regions. So there are a lot of things that could be done, and I don't think they can be done. And I think by giving farmers free electricity, you know, it's a no surprise that they overpump the aquifers. I mean, I would do it. You know, I mean, somebody said electricity was free. I'd say, gee, I'm going to do this because that's a large component of the cost of irrigated agriculture. So it's the cheap way of doing it, and you pump it dry. And, and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and certainly, in terms of the subsidies to agriculture in India, the direct subsidies for water is probably about a um, billion dollars a year. But the subsidies, because of the, the opportunity cost of the power, is about $4 billion a year. So the Indian agriculture is getting huge subsidies by misallocating resources. And I think that has to stop. And you don't stop it by building all these interconnections and saying we're going to spend more money to do a sort of similar sort of thing. And one needs to be able to sit down and rationally think about it. Now, I'll give you a little story. I was in the Corps of Engineers as as a visitor last year, and uh, there was a, a Senate hearing on, uh, on some big water bill that was coming up, and the general in charge of the Corps of Engineers, General Flowers, was testifying, and he said something about a national water policy, and one of the senators who was at the hearing said, excuse me, General Flowers, if you ever use those two words together again, I personally will make sure you lose your job. That Water in the United States is a state thing. It does not belong to the federal government. It belongs to the states. And you better shape up, otherwise you're out of the job. This has actually happened. And this is a, a three- or four-star general in his uniform, you know, looking uh, really spiffy and looking like a tough guy. And this senator saying, you do that one more time, you're out of a job. You know, so we, we don't have a national policy. We, don't, we have several different agencies all competing with each other, all spending federal money in, 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 in against each other, and, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. We need to have some way of, of doing that. So, you know, we, we're as to blame as much as any of these other countries, and in the fact, they often look to the United States and say, that's the way you're doing it. Um, so I, I think it's, it, it, it's a problem. It's politically very attractive to grab hold of projects because there's a lot of money involved in water projects. I mean, the the uh, Rivers and Harbors Bill is always called a pork barrel for exactly that reason. Let's think. Any question? Um, in one of your last slides, you highlighted uh, a conclusion the importance of political will and institutional capacity building um, in order to address these. And I very much appreciate that. I think it's as much a, uh, a uh, testament of political will as it is technology. So uh, that's my comment. My, question is, I'm still unclear um, about your basic question about myth or reality of the global water crisis. It seems that some of your early slides, when you paint the broad picture um, with the maps internationally, there are large areas of the globe where there are uh, physical water shortages, which will likely worsen with population growth and economic growth and so forth. Um, and if one you know, averages out uh, 
across the globe, of course, uh, it may be imbalanced, but um, when one takes it regionally, I'm talking about large regions, uh, it uh, may not be. And I understand one of your main points is this embodied water and addressing that somewhat through trade. Is that the entire answer? Um, and is that the, uh, the way of moving from crisis um, to um, you know, out of crisis? Or uh, are you being unclear, I guess? Well, let's take the U.S. for the start. Because our demand for water is flattened out or, or, or is may in fact continue to go down, we've got a lot of extra water we otherwise would have, were using for other things. And now that's available for good things. And so we're easing up a little bit on the assault on the environment in the United States from the water point of view. So that's, that's good. And any country that will be able to do that is a good thing. Now, other countries don't have the leeway because they were not overusing water the way we were in, in colossal, like drunken sailors. They, they've been very parsimonious. But I think that, the, as you point out, the, anything you can do to re reduce the stress on the ecosystem is a good thing. And one of them is to not use, uh, not dry up all the rivers, for instance. Uh, that's, that's, that's not a good thing to do with the way the Chinese have been doing, uh, for instance. And even the Chinese have been shamed a little bit into um, now the Yellow River actually flows to the ocean, 50 cubic meters per second. And it's a very pathetic uh, view of that huge delta. And you've got this one little stream going through the middle. But it's better than not having anything at all. And in fact, the Chinese may well be on a way of, of trying to improve that situation. But they have conflicts within the nine provinces in the Yellow River. And it's, you know, it may not be democratic fighting, but it's it's fighting between these these provincial assemblies and prov provincial governors who just behave very much like separate warlords and things. So you've got a lot of conflict in, in that situation. Um, but in other areas, in, uh, you know, it's always that Mother Nature knows best. And that, you know, normally people don't live in deserts, okay? Or the population density in deserts is usually low. Um, like in Los Angeles, uh, for instance, is a desert. Uh, you know, that's a conscious act of hubris, okay? And that's okay if people want to do that. And we decide that we want to do keep this working. That's better than having a war or two just to liven up the proceedings, which is an alternative that we've recently been engaged in. But So, you know, we can make those decisions. But uh, we'd like to think we make those type of decisions intelligently. And I think this is... The problem that you have in countries like Saudi Arabia, which is, has some of the highest birth rates in the world, and they have a lot of a, a mineral called oil, which is good, and they desalinate a lot of water, but the, all of the rest of the water is sort of being used up in silly ways that they didn't need to do, and they didn't need to create this large population of generally unhappy people, which, is, which will ricochet somewhere in the world. Um, so. You know, it is, it's the, the population and the economic development uh, which will cause a lot of problems. And uh, I don't think we can turn the clock back. I mean, the, you know, the, there is a, a group called Eden now, and they want to restore the Iraqi marshes. And, and I actually lost a lot of my friends at a meeting at Harvard when I said, those marshes are gonzo. Um, maybe you can have 10% of them restored. but. You know, there's no way of going back. And this project is called Eden Again. So we're going to go back to Eden. This is the original part of the world where the, the Garden of Eden was. I think that that's, that's a non-starter. We're not, not going to do that. Uh, we may have a zoo, okay? And, and this is, gets people even more excited when you say, well, we could run the Iraqi marshes like a zoo. You know, we could have, you know, the right amount of species and the right amount of people. And there's a little like those things out in the desert in in Arizona, you know, those, uh, what are they called? Those bio, biodromes. But th that's about, I think, all we can accomplish when we have uh, a situation with, you know, $8 billion, $8 billion people bump, bumping shoulders with each other and wanting to have an existence. And, and their right to exist is just as much as ours. So, you know, the issue between the ecosystem and Homo sapiens gets worse and worse as the population rises. So I don't think we can turn it back. I think we can make it a lot better than it is. I mean, we can, and we have made huge improvements in the United States. 
Uh, and I think that places like China will indeed make huge improvements as they, you know, end up choking on their own effluent like we did in Pittsburgh. Uh, and, and uh, you know, and I grew up in England where I thought all rivers were bright purple and orange. And, you know, there was a surprise to, I came to the United States in 1960. This was heaven in comparison to where I came from and is badly polluted in, in 1960. So there, it's, it's a discerning of spirits, maybe, the way I would view it. And, you know, it's, maybe that's not a satisfactory answer, but I'm fairly optimistic, as you can gather from this thing, that we can make it in reasonable order for the next two generations. Well, I think that they would have been a, a little bit better had they been more modest in the tar or they targeted it better, I think, or focused a little bit more on the type of technology choices that, that, that are available. I mean, I think that <clears throat> on the sanitation side, there's some wonderful things happening in India by the Slum Dwellers Association. And this is interesting. We generally think of slum dwellers as being very downtrodden and oppressed. There's a Slum Dwellers uh, Association in India has 700,000 members, and they are very active in urban sanitation, and they're doing wonderful things. The city of um, Bombay, Mumbai, or however you mumble it these days, had um, uh, provided uh, latrines for uh, one latrine for each 4,000 people, I think is what it is. Talk about long lines to go to the toilet. Um, and they've been able to uh, get one latrine for 50 people at about the same cost. And, and so and that's still unpleasant, but it's a lot better than one for 4,000 because one for 4,000 means 50 people use it and everybody else uses the, the, the environment. So th there, are, there are things like that. And I think that's not been adequately addressed in the, in the Millennium Development Goals. And it's all the usual characters, you know, the World Bank, USAID, all the big spenders get together and they all of this circled by all of the consultants and the contractors and the equipment suppliers and you know what happens in that setting. I mean there's nothing wrong with it, but you don't necessarily get the impacts that you that that you could have had otherwise. Uh, one more question. Hmm. Do a lottery. I think gentleman over there has uh, for if we take a look at our favorite crop uh, short of getting people into sand or stones or even asphalt <coughs> or rocks to replace it, uh, are there any are there any ground covers uh, or, there, or or going into a vegetable or fruit gardens or something that would uh, uh, either reduce the evaporation from it or the use of water for, for grass or that would uh, do something which from an economic and other uh, systems point of view make a lot more sense rather than Scott tell us what to do. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, the, the, exa the experiences I had uh, two weeks ago in Arizona were interesting because I was staying in Phoenix and then I went to Tucson. Tucson is not that far away. It's about an hour's drive or so. And the difference was amazing. The people in Tucson have this uh, desert landscaped uh, gardens. Uh, um, Tom Maddock, for instance, who was a former student of mine who was chair of the department, hydrology at the University of Arizona in Tucson has a beautiful lot with, I've never seen so many different cactuses and, and things like that, and all of his neighbors. It's just a natural vegetation. The houses fit in very well. There are local low-style houses, and you wouldn't even know that they were there on the hillside. It was, it's a wonderful experience, and you wonder why they didn't do that in Phoenix, and because Phoenix has, in fact, a wonderful bio, bio, botanical garden where I've they have a fantastic selection of cactuses and native fauna. But somehow or other, uh, Phoenix seems to be built around a series of golf courses. And uh, they're not playing golf in the desert. They're playing golf and they think they're in St. Andrews or somewhere. Um, and, and it, you know, it's a different mentality. But right there in the same eco zone, you have these radically different things. Now, if the price of water was made high enough, then you would find that either the green fees would be not reachable by most people or that they'd actually say, well, maybe we'll just water the greens 
for a while, or maybe we'll do what they do in Morocco, which is they stabilize the sand with oil and then they paint it green. Uh, so, you know, there are many ways of, of playing golf, uh, you know, in this thing. But you're right. I mean, the reason in Phoenix why they don't do it is because they don't pay very much for water. There's, there's you know, the, there is a lot of uh, demand management that could go on. And, the, the, you know, if, if I was running that, I would privatize the water department and make a lot of money <laughs> in Phoenix. I mean, you, you could double, triple the price and, and, and still be paying less than people out here are paying. So it's, um, it's, it's that sort of thing. There are, there are options available, but nobody's going to choose those options unless you send them a signal. So the signal in this particular case in the United States is price because people can afford to, to do that. In other countries, uh, it's very hard to think about pricing for people who are very poor. But then you have the cross-subsidization possibility where you can subsidize from industry to the, to the poor people. So lots of things can be done on that. And I think that, that uh, but it does require some movement in terms of pricing and, and getting people against their inhibitions for pricing. A lot of people say the poor can't afford to pay. Well, the poor pay in most third world countries maybe six to ten times as much per unit for water as the rich do. Now, they buy it in jerry cans. They don't have it piped into the houses. But uh, they pay an awful lot for water. And so, you know, there is a, a, a tremendous potential there for generating revenue, getting connections to the, to the, to the, to the poor. So a lot, of, a lot of things could happen. I mean, it doesn't solve the question up here about the, the realignment of the ecosystem because we're still going to be taking water for those for those things. Okay. Thank you. Go a little bit further. Okay. I'm happy. No, no, I'm happy. How about two more questions? Back in the front. Um, one of your slides showed the benefit cost analysis of different parts of the world. Um, I can understand it's fairly easy to quantify the cost. How do you quantify benefits which are fairly indirect in nature and they vary quite quite dramatically across the world and how they're used and how they're valued. Well, look at the papers by this group at the World Health Organization, Hutton, and as a, the source of those data. They have done excellent uh, work on trying to estimate what happens if you improve the quality of water in terms of the uh, absenteeism at work, the uh, cost of treatment, the hospital time, the infirmary time, all of these things, they've, they've gone down and they've actually nailed those down. And the, the pie chart, which I didn't really discuss very much, showed the biggest benefit is the loss of time due to poor, poor water quality. And I, I know that when I was living in New Delhi, I had, again, too many servants, but most of them were sick most of the time. And I was sort of running an unlicensed dispensary, uh, you know, to keep these people working. And when people are sick, their productivity goes down remarkably. I had a, um, a cook who lived 12 kilometers from where I lived, and he bicycled in every day. And he was mostly sick, and all of his energy went into his locomotion, of getting from where he lived to my house, and then he would sit in the shade all day. I thought at first he was lazy, but actually he was doing exactly the right thing because he was metabolizing at a very low rate, and he needed that energy to locomote himself back to where he lived. Uh, you know, by raising his income, I was able to get him to eat more. I mean, there's very direct connections here between the amount of uh, food you eat and the amount of uh, energy you can put out. And so I had one happy cook after a while when I raised his salary, um, and so he could afford to both do locomotion and work. Uh, and so, you know, these, these, these are the sort of things that happen. I mean, it's very direct connections, and certainly for gastrointestinal diseases, those are the ones which we're talking about mainly here for the water, improving the water quality or the sanitation. Uh, they have very direct effects, and they can be quantified. And, but who gets the benefit of that? The employers get the benefit of it, not the water company. Okay. So there was another. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Your comment is a professional and a teacher that on whether or not you think the professions are adequately integrating the political and institutional options to address these problems. Because you talk, when you talk about the intellect issues, issues of 
India or whoever made the comment, that senator who made the comment to the general, okay? Somebody's advising them, okay? And um, the, 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 the menu of options that get put in front, okay, uh, even made it maybe politically difficult. You mentioned your Spanish case, and there's lots of other cases. And if everybody had taken Adamas' courses, and today's generation of that, maybe we would have a wider menu of alternatives getting considered all the time, rather than the technological alternatives, okay, which are, to some extent, easy and, as you suggest, opportunities for rent seeking. Mm -hmm. But is, is there something more that the professions and the academic institutions can be doing, okay, so that we have more integrated options getting considered, whether it's in India or in the United States? Well, you know, I, I like to take a positive stand on that and say that uh, there has been a lot of work by the various big NGOs and led by the, the places like the Global Water Partnership or the World Water Council, and they're saying in order to move forward on these issues, you need to have integrated water resources management. Now, that's a big catch-all, but it does – you can hold people's feet to the fire on that and say it doesn't just mean river basin planning the way the engineers have done it. It means integrating a lot of other things. So, for instance, trade and transit are very important issues on um, as bargaining chips in international river basins. And that's you, – you don't argue about the water, you argue about the economic benefits. And then you can trade and, and, and do things in that way. So you've got to give people to think in a broader sense and you have to keep on hammering on them. It's not just the technology. Technology is very important because it gives you a lot of uh, alternative ways. Um, I've always characterized it as uh, uh, Pareto means, meets uh, Coase, you know, that uh, uh, Wilfredo Pareto was a railway engineer uh, in Italy who um, has some very important things to say about welfare economics. And uh, Ronald Coase was a lawyer who got a Nobel Prize in, in economics just recently. I think he wrote about two or three papers that actually got him the Nobel Prize. But uh, Pareto talked about Pareto frontiers and opportunities that can be done from a technical point of view. And Coase is talking about jawboning, the negotiation skills that, that go along. And what you have in this thing is what you need is you need both of those. Because right now in the United States, we've got lots of jawboning on these issues, lots of political action without any concept of where the frontier is. So what we need is we need Pareto. And this is a lot of technical work needs to be done on devising Pareto, Pareto solutions. Doesn't mean to say those are the solutions that politically ought to come out, but they say that you shouldn't be too far away from the frontier. As, as you know, the Pareto covers a wide range of, of, of options. And I think that's where, where I think we ought to be going. And I think the profession large, you know, you, you can't take your engineers and have them spend all their time doing politics and economics. They've got to be damn good engineers and they've got to be able to create the Pareto services, the transformation curves between what the investments will yield. But they have to be aware that, that that's not the solution. That's the starting point of the jawboning about how you actually arrive at political decisions. A lot of people say, oh, the, the political decisions, all decisions are political in water. And, and we fool ourselves if we think there are technical solutions. I mean, I think the, the, the things I've talked about, the, uh, all of these things, the uh, virtual water, the desalination, are all technical solutions which have to be part of the overall negotiating set. And, uh, and I think that's, that's – I, I see a lot of progress, actually. And, uh, I was recently in India and Bangladesh and, and Pakistan, and um, at least the government people seem to be more aware of these issues than, say, 20 years ago. You know, it seemed to be – they maybe didn't know exactly what to do about it, but they certainly – it's in all of the uh, water policy plans now. We see this, these concepts of, of floating around, and certainly in, in Asia. Uh, in China also. China is uh, trying to organize uh, in the water sector uh, citizen participation. And, of course, it's always hard when you don't have a democracy to know what it means to do participation, but there, that's actually in the water law, and they're trying to figure out – how to get citizens to participate to discuss the technical solutions in a political context. So I think, you know, there's, that's a lot of progress in 20 or 30 years. It's not perfect. 
I know it could probably go a lot longer, but I think we have to give the speaker a break. And we all thank Professor Rogers. Thank you very much.